Shabbat Shalom. I am sitting here completely relaxed, no makeup, and I don't care. <laughs> um, it's the Sabbath, and the past couple of weeks we have been a little bit crazed because of storm things and just life happening. So I'm really excited to get um, the chance to come back and talk. Um, talk Torah with everybody. So, um, as you know, if you're watching for the first time, you may not know. So as you know, if you have watched, I'm a mother of four and, um, don't get a lot of quiet moments. Um, my husband is here, but there's a chance that my five-year-old or my seven-year-old or my 10-year-old or my 12-year-old may burst in and that's fine. Uh, they're welcome to do that. <laughs> Just be patient. So anyway, um, the Torah portions this week were amazing and there's so much to say. Um, so I am going to try to keep it as brief as I can. I know I say that every time and most of the time I have to make like part one, two, and three. <laughs> so <laughs> anyhow, I'm going to try to do this in one fell swoop. We all know that's kind of a joke though. So um, this is the parashat or the Torah portion, uh, Katisa or Katessa, um, however you want to pronounce it. I am not a Hebrew speaker yet. <laughs> I will be one day, but that day has not come. So as of today, I'm going to do my best. And I have the, um, the Messianic Jewish Family Bible that I read from. And I love it very much. And so a lot of the pronunciations, it uses a lot of the Hebrew actual literal names and translations. And so <laughs> it gets a little funny when I try to read from it, but I do my best. Okay, so here in this portion, we're kind of closing up the priesthood instructions that um, the father gives Moses. And we're going into um, the testimony about the golden calf and the disobedience so swift <laughs> for them to disobey so um remember Moses has gone up he's ascended up onto the mountain the people basically told him we're afraid to speak to God because he shook the mountain and it was on fire and they said like you can go up in that but we're gonna stay here so he had been up there for several days um getting the instructions, getting the testimony. He was being spoken to day and night by the angel of the Lord and by the Lord himself. And so it, there was a lot to do. <laughs> he was kind of um, taking an account of everything that had ever happened in the entire world up to that point. And those, those things take time. So, <laughs> so um, interesting. I listened to a few different people throughout the week as much as I can. And Micah and I this morning listened to, um, his ministry is called Lion and the Lion and Lamb Ministries. He is a Messianic Jew who lives in like Tulsa, Oklahoma area. And so he's kind of country. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, but he's very well versed in Jewish history, in the, the Torah and also, um, stories surrounding what was taking place so he kind of went into depth and gives a perspective that I really like so listening to him I'm going to share a few of the things that he kind of uh, touched on this morning so we start with um, Exodus 30 verse 11 and I'm going to read just bits and pieces and I'll kind of just sum up but he's talking to him about taking the census um, and about ransom money and you have to remember um, the Israelites left Egypt, they were slaves. And in order to be freed as a slave or a servant to someone, to your master, you have to pay a ransom. And God actually forced the Egyptians to pay the ransom on behalf of the children of Israel, because that's, that's, that's who he is. It's how he is. He's amazing. But he was, uh, as a reminder to them every year, he, um, See, we listen to this portion and we think, oh, they have to pay offerings. That's not what this was. It was actually ransom money. Um, and they were paying him this time. They were paying him. 
uh, each man was to pay um, 20 years and above were to give this offering to Adonai. The rich were not to give any more than the poor. And the poor were not to give any less than the rich. So it was a, a flat rate of ransom for them. Obviously, who paid our ransom? Yeshua, the, the Lamb of God. And so this is really cool. Um, at this time, he it was to make atonement for their souls. And um, you were to take the atonement money and give it to the service of the tent of meeting. Because they were going to be building and fashioning all these intricate works of art for the father to minister to him. And so, um, then there was the basin for washing. So, okay, that was the, the atonement, um, and the, the ransom money. And every time that they were going to take a census, he, um, commanded that they pay ransom. And so he was saying, anytime you count your numbers and realize that the promise that I gave to Abraham is fulfilled, that you're going to be as numerous as the stars of the heavens and the sand on the seashore, um, you're going to remind yourself um, by paying ransom <laughs> because you need to remind yourself that you were once <laughs> lost and now you're found. You were once a slave and now you're free. And so I thought that was really cool. Everything that he, I'm learning that everything he sets up um, in his commands to Moses are reminders of where he has brought us from, it seems, and also um, indicators of where he's taking us and what he's going to do through the Messiah. So I just think it's really cool, the parallels here. Uh, the basin for washing, obviously, they're going into the tent of meeting, Aaron and his sons. And so he has them set up a um a bowls of bronze and they're to wash their hands and their feet because they are going to be the ones that are making um sacrifices and offerings to the lord on the behalf of the people if they aren't clean okay again this is all symbolic it's not they their hands and feet didn't have to be clean hold on i'm going to shut my door uh, you can still hear me but um their hands and feet excuse me, did not have to be clean, um, in terms of <laughs> physically, um, it was a, it was, it, it literally says, so they do not die, they need to wash their hands and feet before they come in, and it'll be a statute throughout their generations, meaning anyone who is going to, <laughs> again, it points to the Messiah, anyone who's going to make atonement or minister on behalf of the, the congregation or the people or the sheep, <laughs> Uh, they have to be clean and there is only one sacrificial lamb who was without spot or blemish um, as we know so they had to go through all these rituals and um, as reminders of you know what God expected but also what he was going to provide so cool he did it from the very beginning of time just pointing to Christ and I just love it so um, then we go through to the anointing oil and he's talking about, he gives an actual recipe for the temple anointing oil. And if I had to venture a guess, I would say that these were the same oils and, um, plants, essential oils, basically that they used to embalm our Messiah, <laughs> which just it's like he knew <laughs> that this was going to take place. Okay. Um, it was myrrh and sweet cinnamon and calamus and cassia. And they were to add it to a, a gallon of olive oil as a carrier. <laughs> I know about essential oils. A lot of you do too. Um, so it was a very specific, he said, do not use this on anyone except for the high, the priests. And who is our high priest? Yeshua. So I believe that this, um, this exact fragrance that he kind of put together or this recipe, um, again, was pointing to our Messiah. A lot of us can just read all this stuff and feel like, what is the point? And um, it, that's our answer, is that everything he was doing was pointing to our future. Okay. Okay. Um, and then he talked about the incense that was supposed to be burned. Um, 
which were the frankincense, etc. And you think about the gifts that were given to um, Yeshua at his after his birth uh, from the kings or the wise men or whatever you want to call them, the seers, um, which were actually like sorcerers, honestly. Um, there was nothing about them indicated in scripture that they were these godly people. Uh, but they did follow astrology <laughs> in in the very much pagan sense. And they knew by looking at God's calendar that there was something different taking place and followed everything that, that he was doing. So um, they came and brought specific gifts. And I remember when it kind of dawned on me, and I'm sure everybody is like, duh. But I remember when it dawned on me that um, the things that they brought were indicative of who he was and what was going to take place. You know, the frankincense, um, the the myrrh and the gold. The gold obviously was for the kingship and um, the frankincense and myrrh for the embalming and burial. I mean, it was just it's, it's interesting. The myrrh was for the, the priesthood, the anointing, like... Um, Anyway, so we're going into chapter 31, and I was really blown away this morning listening to Monty Judah um, talk about this. Uh, in verse th uh, chapter 31, verse 1, it says, Then Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, son of Uri, or Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, understanding, no and knowledge in all kinds of craftsmanship to make ingenious designs uh, to forge with gold and silver and bronze as well as the cutting of stones and uh, for setting and carving wood to work in all manner of craftsmanship okay so uh, Bessalel was the grandson of her and if you remember um, when they were when the Amalekites came out to fight the Israelites in the wilderness after they had been released from Egypt they um, Moses held up his his arms and basically as long as he held up his arms the Israelites would continue to to be victorious and when they when he would get weak and let them down they would start to lose and so um, Aaron Moses brother came on one side of him and lifted up one arm and her um, his their dear friend he was part of he was like you know part of the inner circle here he held up the other arm and a couple of things here that um, Mr. Judah pointed out is that he was from the tribe of Judah. And it's interesting because he was, you know, they were talking about the tent of meeting, which was a Le Levitical ministry that they were setting up. And the fact that he chose someone from a tribe that was not involved in the priesthood was very interesting. And it didn't even cross my mind until I heard him say that this morning. I was like, oh my gosh, that is weird. Um, so he, he chose somebody from the tribe of Judah. And he chose him, uh, the son the son of Uri, the son of Hur. Okay, so he was Hur's grandson. Um, so he, he was probably a lot younger. But he started to talk about Hur. And we don't know a ton about him. Um, if y'all remember... Um, the movie um, Ben Hur, which means son of Hur, H U R, not H E R, obviously, son of Hur. Um, it was the chariots, and it actually references the Messiah, and about, you know, this whole, the whole story. He goes into this account of how when the writer of the story was trying to um, come up with the name of the main character, he went to the Hebrew community and he asked people he asked around and said if I were to come up with a name for this character what is a name of someone in Jewish history who is honored and esteemed just a normal person I'm not talking about a prophet or something like that but somebody who did something great and the first thing they said was her and the, the story and the account um, from Jewish history which you know, um, usually coincides with the Torah and it's just, it expounds, um, apparently what went down with her. Okay. So he's one of the ones who lifts up the arms. He was kind of really tight with, um, Moses and Aaron, obviously. And, um, 
this is just absolutely amazing. So um, they, it's told that he, whenever uh, Moses was up on Mount Sinai, up at the, the top of the mountain with, you know, <laughs> the Lord and, and in, in his presence, that Aaron, he left Aaron and her in charge of the people. And um, of course, the people revolted and said, we don't know what's happened to Moses because he went up in the middle of the smoke and the fire and the earthquake and they don't they're thinking that he has died like we're left here let's just move on right so um immediately the story is that her when they were like let's just build ourselves our own god and follow him and so they did the golden calf thing well before and the people were like there's millions of them they're in a complete uproar they had come out of paganism and many of them didn't even understand what that meant at this point. Um, God is revealing himself to them and they were human. So here we go. Her stood up and said, absolutely not. We are not going to forsake what God has commanded us and we're not going to abandon Moses. No. And the people were, it sounds to me like, you know, the mob mentality, but there's a spirit that goes behind it. And we've seen that in our culture in this day and age, where if you disagree, you literally get like crucified. Um, so he, he basically stands up for righteousness and he says, no, we're not going to do that. And when he stands up against the people, they kill him. Um, and this is the story. I mean, this is like historical document about his life. This is how he died. And after these accounts, you don't hear anything else about her. This is the last time he's mentioned. Um, so at that point, because we always read, I read the story and it's coming up here in the portion. Aaron just kind of acquiesced to this crazy, this lunacy of let's make another God because ours has just, you know, who knows what Moses, they, they were following man, not God. Honestly, they were like, well, Moses, you know, he's probably been killed. So let's just make, we have to have someone telling us what to do because <laughs> there's a reason they call him the lost sheep of Israel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> us, the lost sheep. So um, anyhow, that's kind of how it went down. And he ended up dying um, for righteousness sake. And Aaron, of course, absolutely terrified, watching his friend probably get ripped to shreds, um, says, okay, 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 okay. Take, <laughs> remove the earrings, <laughs> like rip them out of your wife's ears. So the earrings, if y'all remember, um, were an actual symbol of the slavery in Egypt. So they were still wearing a reminder of their their slavery and so um god even talks about that if you want to if you're if you have a servant who's been with you all this time and he chooses to stay with you he'll work as like a freed man but he, you'll you'll pierce his ear because he's still he's basically showing that you're someone's property so it's very interesting that the thing that denoted slavery he said bring it here and this is going to be your god there's so much there, obviously. So um, dig a little deeper on that one. I know I will, and I have been. So um, they bring all of this, and and let's let's just also remember that these piercings, these rings that were in their ear, were like permanently affixed. There was no little screw on back like we have. We go to, you know, the the parlor, the tattoo parlor, or Claire's or Walmart or wherever you go get your ears pierced, and they put this pretty little back on that comes off and on. They had to rip, they had to shed blood, first of all, for their new God. They had to wound themselves, and um, it was probably extremely painful. It wasn't this pretty little earring like we think, okay? So there was, there was a different, um, we got to put on a different set of glasses to, to really read the scripture and understand it. So um, anyhow, her, his grandson was actually chosen um because of you think about the family that he's coming from and the uh, commitment to the Lord throughout the generations. So her was a godly man. He stood up for what was right when it wasn't popular. Can I get an amen? Um, and in this day and age and in our culture, it's getting to the point where if you have the opinion that is that lines up with scripture, 
So it's, if you're, if you're not following the crowd and you're following the Holy Spirit, the chances of you being the odd man out are not just completely, you know, 100%. It's going to happen at one point or another, and you're going to have to either stand up for what you believe in, which is this, <laughs> um, or you're going to have to just kind of cower and allow it to happen, like Aaron. We can learn from Aaron, and we, we can criticize him all we want, okay, but there has been much <laughs> less significant things um, and more, you know, less consequential like he literally was trying to save his own life okay if, and if we understand things in this context it makes a big difference so <laughs> there have been instances in our culture today where we can just kind of bow down and accept things or we can say no that's not how it's going to be for me in my house and um I do believe that it makes a difference because the more you tolerate <laughs> the more freedom you give up and so um it's a very big lesson for us to learn and we'll get to that here in a minute but um anyway just wanted to share that little tidbit because we we skip i mean it, it gives he's he's gonna be the one who's working on the levitical temple of the lord or the tabernacle or the tent of meeting whatever you call it and he's not even from the tribe of levi so there was a significance there because it also gave his genealogy when god gives the, the family line, there is a reason that he does it, okay? He does it when he's talking about the birth of Messiah. He does it when he's talking about um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why he's called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because he is reminding us where we came from, and not just names, but their stories and why they're important to us. So we can learn from history and not repeat the same mistakes, and we can maybe learn some of the good. So, okay. Okay. Um, here we go. In, so chapter 31. Now, he's giving all these instructions for the tabernacle. And then again, after, because he's already given the uh, commands, the commandments, the Ten Commandments and the um, commandments or instructions about uh, family and neighbors and all these things, right? And how to worship the Lord. He comes back. Now, when there's a second mention of something, we have to pay attention because as we know, he doesn't just spout out things because they're not important. If God says something, it's because he in, He says it with intention. Okay, so second time around, after all these things, all these instructions about the temple, he's like, oh, and by the way, let me reiterate. Um, in verse 12, Adonai spoke to Moses saying, Speak now to B'nai Yisrael, uh, saying, the sons of Israel, Surely you must keep my Shabbat. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations so that you may know that I am at a nigh who sanctifies you. Therefore, you are to keep the Shabbat or the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Okay, holy does not mean, oh, you know, like what we've always been taught. <laughs> okay, holy, sanctified, it literally means separate, different, and set apart. Okay, he says this is my the sign of our covenant okay everyone who profanes it will will die for whoever does any work during shabbat that soul will be cut off from the midst of his people okay do you remember when in the garden adam and eve uh were told not to partake of the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or to eat of its fruit and um the lord said for the day that you do you will surely die so i was listening to the book of jubilees this week and i'm still in the middle of it because it's a lot to like digest so i keep rewinding and re-listening, but he says to them, um, Adam and Eve died one year before their thousandth birthday, basically. And he said, um, in Jubilees, it says, now the reason that God did not allow them to live a full 1,000 years, because a 1,000 years is, was a day to the Lord, right? When he says, the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, did they die on the day that they ate of the fruit? No. He said... <laughs> With, he said within the thousand years they had to die. They were meant to live for eternity with uh, Jehovah as we all were. Um, and that sin prohibited that from happening, obviously. So he said on the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And we're like, 
okay, that didn't happen. You know, I remember as a kid thinking, well, that was not true. Like, did he just change his mind? That doesn't seem like something God does, you know. And he tells them that because he, a day to the Lord, literally um, a thousand years. That's So they fell short by like one, I think one year or one day of the thousand year mark of on this earth. And so um, I thought that was really interesting, um, given the context of him saying, if you if you break the Sabbath, you will die. Remember, in a few chapters back, when he's giving the he hasn't actually, you know, with the finger of God written on the tablets, he hasn't done that yet. OK, um, he he says to them, when you if you do the things that I'm going to command you, there will be no sickness. I'm the Lord who heals you. Right. So he gives a promise of basically life and um, life to the full. No illness, no chronic fatigue, none of that crap, right? Okay, so um, the very next thing that he does in that chapter is that he provides the manna and the first command that he ever gives them is you can collect it for six days, but on the seventh day, I won't even give it. So you can go out and try to work for it and gather it, but it won't be there. And by the way, gather as much as you need every day because I'm going to provide every day. The next day, there'll be just enough. So get just enough. And if you keep too much and you hoard it, it's going to rot and it's going to get maggots basically. And so, um, except the sixth day, you gather double, which is Friday, the day of preparation for Sabbath. And the next day it won't rot. And it was the only day that it didn't rot or get bugs. And so, um, when he says, if you do what I command you and you will live a full life and a healthy life and there will be no illness because I'm the Lord who heals you. That's what he was talking about. Cause the very next thing he tells them to do is to, and he says, this day is set apart to the Lord because I worked for six days and I rested on the seventh day. Okay. When he says you will surely die, if you do not honor the Sabbath, it doesn't mean you're going to drop dead in a you know, fire's going to come from heaven and consume you. I believe that the, the, the whole point of the Sabbath is trust. And he, ta- he goes on to talk about the fact that it is a perpetual sign of our covenant together. What was Mount Sinai? It was the man.
So as we know, Mount Sinai was literally the marriage ceremony between God and his people. Um, and the more you look at the language that he um, used, and the more you look at what he did, it was literally all one giant uh, marriage ceremony. It, it's very interesting. And so in the midst of all of that, he's trying to tell them this is the symbol, this is the sign. Um, you know, when you get married, you wear a ring, you make a physical covenant with your spouse. And whew, um, yeah, there's a lot to this. Okay, so we're gonna fast forward to the molten calf. So I kind of already went through the story of her and how he was literally um, sacrificed in like the people, the angry mob, because he said, absolutely not. We're not going to worship other gods. And they said, well, then we don't need you. Um, so now we're listening to Aaron. Aaron tells them to take the, the rings off of their ears and literally break them off. Um, so it's very interesting to me that they took the thing that was a reminder of their trauma and their past and their slavery and the thing that God brought them out of and they fashioned an idol out of it okay and this was just re it really spoke to me let me just say that because it is so easy to worship um, something that was meant to destroy us and let's just say you know we're really proud of who we are because of what we've been through and um we forget that we're to honor the one who brought us through it because without him we would still be stuck there <laughs> and meanwhile you know and i used to be real judgy about israel the, pe the people of israel how on earth could they do this in the middle of god moving and i mean there's literally they can look up and there's fire on this mountain and smoke and there's earthquaking presence of God like miles away and here they sit worshiping their junk <laughs> like you really you think about it but um now it makes a lot of sense to me because um we are we're just unfortunately we can be very blind to our own issues <laughs> and our own golden calves so they go and they basically, what they say is they take all the stuff from their, uh, the gold that they were bound with in Egypt and the reminder of their slavery and they made a golden calf out of it. And they said, this is our God. This is your God, Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Like how offensive to Yahweh, how utterly ridiculous, um, and yet... We do the same thing. Um, well, how did they know, first of all, to make this golden calf? Because this was part of their comfortable past, even though it was absolute misery. <laughs> um, we always look at the past with rose-colored glasses. You want to go back to the way it was, the good old days, because it it's like Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> um, and so they made this golden calf based on the images of the gods of Egypt, because that's who they were serving this whole time. And unknowingly thinking that they were still God's people and that they were serving their God. Now, in modern Christianity, this is a daily occurrence, you guys. And um, there's probably still 10,000 areas that I'm blind to that I'm doing this, and I don't even know it, okay? Um, the the main thing that stands out to me is that we we follow the calendar of paganism and we don't we don't honor and observe the Lord's appointed times but we actually in turn have exchanged them for pagan rituals pagan holidays um, every last freaking holiday that we celebrate including Easter which is coming up. <laughs> is not a feast of the Lord and it is definitely not celebrated during the time of the feasts of the Lord, which are his appointed times. And they are covenants. They are also signs of the covenant. They're an extension of the Sabbath. Um, just seriously trust me on this. I have been relentlessly reading and studying 
um, scripture and, and biblical history books that go along with uh, the 66 books of the Bible, you guys, please hear me. We have golden calves built and we have bowed down and given our lives, our finances, our children over to them. We have set up other gods for ourselves. There is no doubt about it. And so we cannot judge the Israelites and say that we would just turn up our noses. We would never do that. We have done that since birth. <laughs> and it has been leavened into our culture to the point where it looks like the truth. And the enemy is just sneaky and deceptive. I'll just say that. But God is greater and he's drawing that remnant back to himself and back to his truth, back to his word and back to his his appointed times. And I'm so thankful to be a part of it because without the Holy Spirit guiding and leading us this way, we never would have seen it. So um, anyway, they make the golden calf and um, and then literally, so they build an altar before it, right? And Aaron made a proclamation saying, tomorrow will be a feast to Adonai. They didn't think they were not worshiping Adonai, you guys. They did not just straight up say, we're just going to follow a different God. They said, this, we are making this, <laughs> we're putting, we're making a box and we're putting God in it. Okay. And let me tell you, hundred percent of us are guilty of this. Okay. Myself included. I am the chief sinner here. Okay. Like I'm not, I'm not pointing a finger other than in a mirror. Um, so they rose up early the next morning and they sacrificed burnt offerings and brought fellowship offerings and the people sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to make merry. Do you know what that means? There's a literal translation that says they, they woke up to play. That don't mean that they did ring around the rosy, we all fall down. <laughs> they had drunkenness and debauchery. Like sex was everywhere and they were like, whatever. And they called it a feast to the Lord. <laughs> and that was the first of many of these celebrations. And we participate in them as Christians. We're not supposed to be doing that, but we do. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> anyway, Adonai said to Moses, go down for your people who you brought up out of the... I love that he calls them Moses' people. <laughs> I'm sorry. It makes me think of like when our kids are acting up and I like, Micah, that's your son. You know, to go get him. Because <laughs> all this time he said, you'll be my people. I'll be your God. And then they start acting a fool. God's like, hey, Moses, your people. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that is hilarious. Uh, go down for your people who you brought up out of the land of Egypt have become debased. Okay. That, that word is like, the, the they're at, they've hit rock bottom and it happened pretty fast. Okay. They've become debased. They quickly turned aside from the path that I commanded from them. He didn't say they turned from him. They turned from his commands, okay? They have made a molten calf. They've worshipped it. They've sacrificed to it and said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. <sighs> you gotta think, God, God's like talking to Moses. He hears this out of the corner of his ear, you know, and he's like, the heck it is! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just saying. Um, then Adonai said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it's a stiff necked people. Therefore, leave me alone so my wrath may burn hot against them. And so I may consume them and make from you a great nation. So he was going to do Noah 2.0 at this point. He's like, I'm taking them out. I'm going to come and just start over with you. Literally. Okay. <laughs> and then Moses sought. This is so powerful. He sought Adonai, his God. Now this convicted me because I would have been like, all right, let's do it. Peace. I'm fine. I'm, I'm tracking with you so everybody else can burn. If we're being honest, that would have been my response. Okay. I am not Moses. Moses was much more righteous. Okay. <laughs> Moses saw Adonai, his God, and said, Adonai, why should you, your wrath burn hot against your people whom you've brought forth from the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say he brought them out to do evil, to slay them in the mountains and annihilate them from the face of the earth? Turn your fierce wrath and relent from this destruction against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and all this land that I have spoken of, I will give your offspring and they will inherit it forever. 
So Adonai relented from the destruction that he said he would do to his people. That is powerful. Like, God doesn't just straight up change his mind, okay? The, he... Do you think he didn't remember his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, or Jacob? Do you think he forgot? No. I believe this exchange was a prophetic um, conversation to exemplify what a Messiah did for us. Moses was a type of Messiah in this instance here. Okay. Um, did God actually have the intention of destroying Israel? I don't know. Probably because their sin. They deserved it. <laughs> um, so do we. And yet Moses interceded and he stood between Israel and the Father and he said, Remember your covenant. Okay. And Yeshua did the same as he was lifted up and he was a reminder of this covenant. Okay. To, to God and a reminder to us. This is just so powerful. Okay. Um, then Moses turned and he went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. Tablets that were written on both sides, on one and on the other. Now, it wasn't front and back, you guys. It wasn't like a paper and you turn it over and you write on the other side. <laughs> I listened to Monty Judah this morning and I was like, I never thought about why would the Bible say that? What was so important about that? And it said, these tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets by the finger of God. Okay. It's talking about the tablets and how they were, it, there was proof that they were written by God because they were front and back. So think of a massive stone etched, not on one side, but through one side and to the other side. Okay, like finger of God etched on the tablet in Hebrew, we believe, Paleo-Hebrew, literally wrote through it, cut completely through the stone, like with a laser. Okay, so you can look and see through the letters. <laughs> this is absolutely amazing and astounding and so beautiful. And here he comes to show them the ketubah and they're already, they're already literally committing adultery with, you know, the, the father and they're they're walking out and they're stepping out on him okay so uh the tablets were the work of god now remember joshua was on the mountain with moses so when joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted he said to moses there's a sound of war within the camp but moses said it is not the voice of a shout of victory nor, nor is it the voice of crying from defeat but i hear the sound of singing okay they are worshiping and having a blast and they're not doing it to adonai they're doing it to this new god that they've set up that they are worshiping as if it is the lord there's so much there i'm just gonna zip it and keep going then it happened, as soon as Moses came near the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing, and his anger burned hot, so he threw the tablets out of his hands and smashed them at the foot of the mountain. Then he took the calf that they had made, and he burned it with fire and ground it into powder and scattered it on the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. <sighs> that's, that's a whole other... Okay. Then Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you to make you bring such a great sin upon them? Aaron said, don't be angry, my Lord. You know these people yourself and how they are set on evil. Does this sound like the days of Noah? Okay, God, there's a cycle to everything that happens in history. It just keeps repeating. And um, again, I was reading Jubilees this week and it goes into detail about the dates of the flood. And the book of Jubilees is actually written from the perspective of the angel of the Lord who, who spoke to Moses and gave him the testimony of creation and the, the whole Torah, right? So it's very interesting um, because it talks about specific dates that things happen with the flood, like when God commanded Noah to build the ark, when the ark was completed, when the doors were shut, when they got into the ark, when the flood, when the floodgates of the firmament opened, uh, when the abyss, the, the floodgates of the deep opened, um, which there were seven and seven, interestingly enough, um, when the waters receded, when the mountains receded, there was, it was always on a specific day of the month and the year. And oddly enough, those days ended up being feast days. I went back and I studied and looked 
and almost every single one of them was either a feast day or a time where the Lord had spoken to the sons of Israel and said, take a census, do this, do that. There was an instruction given as a reminder of his appointed times, okay? The flood, literally, when the floodgates opened and it began, that was Passover because he was preserving the righteous in the ark and he was destroying the enemy, okay? <sighs> This is insane. All right. So um, I believe, well, and we, we see that he actually states this is my Passover when he's bringing them out of the land of Egypt. Okay. Um, the Ten Commandments, God coming to dwell, the, the marriage ceremony where he brings the 70 elders up the mountain. I believe that that uh, took place on Sukkot. And if you, and this, all of this that's taking place right now. So they're <laughs> celebrating a feast that is in or around the same time as when, because Moses was up on the mountain for 40 days. So we don't know the exact days or how long God allowed this to take place, but we know that they began at a certain time. And then Moses was told, get down and go look after your people because they're, they're walking astray. Okay. Um, I noticed that the pagan festivals and the feasts and all the things that are um, a counterfeit for God's appointed times, they typically happen on or around God's appointed time. So it's very close to the truth. It's just a little off. And so um, it just, it was very interesting to me. And I, I think that um, we, if we were to look at the days, the months, the years, um, we would see that these events are happening on appointed times or the events that they are perpetuating are happening to draw away from the Lord's appointed times. Okay. So he came near the camp. He saw all this stuff, right? And he made them drink the water with the golden uh, calf, the powder from it. What did this people do to Aaron? You know, he's, he's upset. He said, don't be angry. You know these people yourself, how they are set on evil, which is what the Lord said about the people in the days of Noah. Um, they said to me, make gods for us to go before us. As, uh, as for this Moses, the man we brought, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't even know what happened to him. So I said to them, whoever has gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me and I threw it into the fire and uh, out came this calf. Then Moses, <laughs> that's interesting. Then Moses saw that the people were unrestrained because Aaron had let them run wild to become a joke among their enemies. Moses stood at the gate of the camp and said, whoever is on Adonai's side, let him come to me. And then all the sons of Levi gathered themselves to him. He then said to them, so apparently the sons of Levi, which not including Aaron, they were not participating. Um, which I thought was very interesting. They refused to to take part in all of this. He said to them, this is what Adonai, the, the God of Israel, says. Every man put on his sword and go uh, to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay his brother, his friend, his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did as Moses said. And that day, from among the people, there fell about 3,000 men. Then Moses said, consecrate your hands today to Adonai. He gave you a blessing, uh, sorry, sorry that so, so that he may give you a blessing today, for every man has been against his son and his brother. So it happened the following day that Moses said to the people, you have committed a horrendous sin, so now I will go up to Adonai and perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So he's going back up the mountain. He was there for 40 days and 40 nights, I believe, so he's going up another 40. Um, then Moses returned to Adonai and said, alas, these people have sinned greatly and have made gods of gold. Yet now, please forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. Very interesting. Adonai said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go, lead the people to the place I told you about. My angel will go before you. Again, my angel, we know who that is, uh, will go before you. Nevertheless, on the day when I take account, I will hold them accountable for their sin. So Adonai struck the people because of what they did with the calf that Aaron had made. Then Adonai said to Moses, leave and get out of this place, you and the people that you have brought out of the land of Egypt, into the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your seed. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Head up to a land flowing with milk and honey, 
but I will not move within the midst of you so that I do not destroy you along the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people, of, uh, when the people heard these dreadful words, they mourned, and no one put on any ornaments. Adonai said to Moses, Say to the sons of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If I were going up among you for one moment, I would consume you. Take off your ornaments so that I may consider what to do to you. So Benai Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments on Mount Horeb, from Mount Horeb onward. Now Moses used, uh, used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far from the camp. He called up the tent of meeting. So it happened everyone who saw Adonai would go out to, to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would arise and stand, everyone at the door of his own tent, and look after Moses until he had gone into the tent. After Moses entered, the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door, and he would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all arose and worshipped, every man at the entrance of his own tent. So Adonai spoke with Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Then he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, or Yeshua, Yehushua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not leave the tent. So Moses said to Adonai, You say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know who you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have found grace in my eyes. Now then, I pray, if I have found grace in your eyes, show me your ways, so that I may know you so that I may find favor in your sight. Consider also that this nation is your people. Okay, he's saying, you made a marriage covenant. <laughs> Remember it and go with us. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest, he answered. But then he said to him, if your presence does not go with me, don't let us go. So first God says, I'm not going with you guys. You're stiff-necked. I don't want to, I don't want to go. I don't want to listen to, are we there yet <laughs> for 40 years? <laughs> Um, and then Moses was like, if you don't come, I'm not going. Okay. Um, then he said to them, if your presence does not go with me, don't go, don't let us go up from here. For how would it be known that I or your people have found favor in your sight? Isn't it because you go with us? That distinguishes us from all the people of the face of the earth. Selah. And I answered Moses, I will also do what you have said, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Then he said, Please show me your glory. So he said, I will cause all my goodness to pass before you. Which we believe <laughs> that that was Yeshua. I will cause all my goodness to pass before you and call out the name of Adonai before you. I will be gracious toward whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will be merciful. But he also said, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Then Adonai said, Please, uh, See, see, a place near me. You will stand on the rock while I, my glory passes by. I will put you in a cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. When I take away my, my hand, you will see my back. But my face cannot be seen. Adonai said to Moses, Carve, uh, carve yourself two tablets of stone like the first ones. So, um... This time, first it was God that carved the stones, and now he's telling Moses he wants him to do the same. Okay, and um, and I will uh, carve two tablets of stone like the first ones, and I will write upon them the words that were on the first tablet which you broke. Be ready by morning, come up to Mount Sinai, and present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come up with you, and do not let anyone be seen throughout the entire mountain. Even the flocks and herds must not graze in front of that mountain. So he carved two tablets of stone, just like the first. Then Moses rose up early in the morning, went up to Sinai as Adonai had commanded him, and took his hand in his hand the two tablets of stone. Then Adonai descended in the cloud, stood with him there as he called on the name of Adonai. Okay, then he passed before him and proclaimed, Adonai, Adonai, the compassion and gracious God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and truth showing mercy to a thousand generations, forgiving the iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means leaving the guilty unpunished, but bringing the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed quickly, quickly bowed his head down to the earth and worshipped. He said, If now I have found grace in your eyes, my Lord, let me please go. Sorry. Ugh. My Lord, please go within our midst. 
even though this is a stiff-necked people, pardon our iniquity and sin and take us for your own inheritance. Then he said, I am cutting a covenant before all your people. I will do wonders such as I have not done in the earth or in any nation. All the people you are among will see the work of Adonai for what I am going to do with you will be awesome. Obey what I'm commanding you today. Behold, I'm going to drive out the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites before you. Watch yourself and make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land where you are going. This is huge. This is huge, huge, huge. Or they will become a snare among you. This has happened to us, especially in the United States of America. Okay? Um, we have followed the ways, the law of the land here, over God. And we have cut a covenant with the ungodly, with the nations, with the nation. And then we're shocked and appalled when we don't get the result that God promised because we aren't following his ways. Just a side note. Okay. Um, otherwise, okay. Sorry. This is very important. Watch yourself that you make no covenant with the inhabitants where you're going or they'll become a snare to you. Instead, you must break down their Asherah poles. Okay, huh? Interesting. For you are to, for you are to bow down to no other god, because Adonai is jealous for his name. He is a jealous god. See that you do not make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. He says it twice. Otherwise, they will prostitute themselves with their gods, and sacrifice to their gods. Someone will invite you, and you will eat from their sacrifice. This is happening today. Okay. Do not take their daughters for your sons. Do not, uh, for their daughters will prostitute themselves with their own gods and cause your sons to prostitute themselves with their gods. You are not to make for yourselves metal gods. You are to keep the feast of unleavened bread for seven days. You are to eat it as I commanded you. At the time appointed in the month of Aviv, for in the month of Aviv you came out from Egypt. Every firstborn of the womb is mine, and from all your cattle you are to sanctify the males, the firstborn of ox and sheep, firstborn donkey. You are to redeem with a lamb, but if you do not redeem it, then you are to break its neck. You must redeem all your firstborn sons. No one should appear before me empty-handed. For six days you will work, on the seventh day you will rest. During the plowing uh, time and the harvest time, you must rest. You are to observe the feast of Shavuot, which is first fruits of the wheat harvest, as well as the feast of ingathering. So those are it's twofold, and he's he commands us back with Noah, three times during the year all your males are to appear before Adonai Elohim, the God of Israel, for I am going to cast out the nations before you, and enlarge your territory. Observing the feasts and observing his appointed times has to do with him commanding that blessing and us overcoming it's part of the overcoming by the blood of the lamb and the word of the what testimony interesting okay so no one will covet your land when you go up to appear before adonai your god three times in the year go up where mount zion or mount moriah whatever you want to call it you are not to offer the blood of my sacrifice with uh with any leaven or hametz nor should the sacrifice of Passover festival remain until morning. You are to bring the choicest first fruits of your land to the house of Adonai your God. You must not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Then Adonai said to Moses, Write these words, for based on these words I have cut covenant with you and with Israel. Based on these words. What were the words about? They were about not following the ways of the nations or the Gentiles. And they were about his appointed times. So this is a second sign of his covenant. It's an extension. It's the Sabbath. Revisited. Okay. <sighs> then Adonai said to Moses, write these words, for based on these words I have cut covenant with you and with Israel. So he stayed there with Adonai for 40 days and 40 nights, and he did not eat bread or drink water. He wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant. Now, it happened when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, when he came down from the mountain that Moses did not know that the skin of his face was radiant because God had spoken with him. This is what our glorified bodies will be like. All right, just read a couple of extra biblical accounts. This is what a glorified body looks like. When Aaron and Benai Israel saw Moses, the skin of his face was shown in rays. 
So they were afraid to come near him, but Moses called out to them. So Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the sons of Israel came near, and he gave them the mitzvot that Adonai had spoken to him in Mount Sinai. When Moses was done speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But when Moses went before Adonai so he could speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. When he came out to, uh, and spoke to the sons of Israel what was commanded, um, the sons of Israel saw the face of Moses and that the skin of his face glistened. So Moses put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with him. How absolutely powerful. There's so much in this and I could go on for hours, but I will let you rest because it is the Sabbath. And I hope that you enjoyed and got something, if anything, out of this. Obviously, it is the Word of God, um, excluding my little tidbits of opinions and things in there. I am so thankful that He has called us into this fold and that we're part of something bigger than ourselves that He has... Um, created and I can't wait to see what's coming and I'm really excited for all of you as well if you have a question or any comments feel free to call text write the email <laughs> um, comment below I appreciate you spending this time with me and Shabbat Shalom